Welcome to AP Chemistry at Heinegger High School. I'm Brian Brown, and today we'll be looking at our fifth and final installment of Chapter 4, looking at concentrations of solution and concentration stoichiometry and how we can apply that in titration situations. Now, two solutions can contain the same compounds, but be quite different because the comp proportions of those compounds can be very different. The term concentration is used to indicate the amount of a solute dissolved in a given quantity of solvent or solution. So besides the fact that it contains hydrochloric acid or whatever, sometimes even more importantly than the chemical itself that's there is what concentration of that substance there is. And there's a number of different ways we have of measuring concentration. Now the first and most common in chemistry is molarity. It should be the one you're most familiar with from last year. Remember molarity is a way to measure the concentration of a solution. And if at all possible, this is what we typically use in chemistry. The symbol for molarity is a capital italics M, and it would stand for the moles of solute divided by the volume of the solution in liters. So remember, molarity, moles per liter. Big M is interchangeable with moles per liter. You can write it either way. Now, dimensional analysis or the equation can be used to interconvert between molarity, volume, and the number of moles. So what we have here is a relationship that we can exploit in a number of different ways. If we have a volume, we can get to the number of moles if we know what our molarity is. If we know the volume of the number of moles, we can calculate the molarity and so on. So there's a relationship here that we end up exploiting in a variety of different ways in AP chemistry. So the molarity equation and understanding its components, how you can use it to get molarity, get moles, get volume in liters, is a really important concept. And remember, if we can get to moles, we can get mass and vice versa. Now, when you're writing the concentration of electrolyte, like an ionic compound, when it dissolves, the relative concentration of the ions in the solution depend upon the chemical formula. So remember, the concentration of the formula is not necessarily the same thing as the concentration of the ions that are present. So for example, if you have a one molar solution of NaCl, one molar NaCl, as it disassociates as a strong electrolyte, would give you a one molar sodium ion concentration and a 1.0 molar chloride ion concentration. So in terms of dissolved solute particles, your total solute concentration would be 2.0 molar. So we say 1.0 molar NaCl, but if you're looking at what's the molarity of the dissolved particles, it's actually double that. And that's a relationship you need to understand. We don't mathematically use it all that often. There, although there are some instances when, if you recall last year when we were looking at uh, situations where things dissolve and it affects colligative properties and so forth, like boiling point elevation and freezing point depression, those are things we'll be getting into later in the year, just not yet. Now, if you had a different substance like Na2SO4, remember one molar Na2SO4 would be 2.0 molar from a sodium ion point of view and a 1.0 molar from a sulfate ion point of view. So when you see the concentration of the strong electrolyte, you need to understand how that would equate to the concentrations of the ions within the strong electrolyte. That's a relationship that should be fundamental and you should be able to use and exploit that. Now, one of the things that you need to be able to do is understand how for a particular lab, like we're doing a lab next week, I've got to make solutions for that lab. How do I go about accurately and precisely using certain measuring devices to measure a certain volume at a certain concentration and so forth? And the piece of equipment you see on the right-hand side next to the balance is known as a volumetric flask. And you need to have a fundamental understanding of how to use a volumetric flask. You will see them throughout the course of the year when we get closer to the AP test and we look at, once again, how do we do certain things for the AP test? We'll talk about using certain types of equipment again. And one of the things we'll see more closely then is a volumetric. So to create a solution of known molarity, one weighs out a known mass and therefore a known number of moles of the solute. And this solute would be added to the volumetric flask, and enough solvent is added to just dissolve the solute. Typically, we're looking at water solutions. So we would weigh out the mass that we would need uh, for to get a, uh, a certain molarity at one liter quantity. So we would find out what that mass is. I want to make one liter of it. What is the mass that would be in one liter of it? You would dump that in the volumetric flask, and then you would add enough water to just dissolve the solid. So you don't fill it all the way up. You add just enough to dissolve the solid. Once it's completely dissolved, because as it dissolved, the volume is going to be changing, but volumes of solids and liquids are not additive, so you need to get it dissolved, 
and then from there you can dilute to your final volume and that's a really important step so you add the solid you dissolve it in enough water and then you dilute that water solution until you get to the right level now this is hard to see on the diagram here but where I've circled the volumetric flask there's actually a ground in line right in right there so this is actually ground into the glass around the uh, all the way around the uh, the circumference of the glassware and what you want to do is you want to add water until the meniscus the bottom dip in that water sits right on that line and that's really how the volumetric flask is designed so it's a very precise way to get a very specific volume the volumetric flask you're looking at here is I believe a one liter so if you filled water to so the meniscus in the neck of that flask was sitting right on that line that would be a very precise way of measuring one liter of liquid much more precise than a graduated cylinder would be and significantly more precise than a flat or a uh, beaker would be remember never use beakers to measure volumes unless you're estimating a volume so that's what you do is you'd weigh out the mass dump it in the volumetric flask add enough water and slowly swirl it until it dissolves and then you're going to dilute to the mist gets gets on the top of the line in the neck of the flask and what we really just talked about here is a dilution situation because um, before we put in water to make it one liter of solution we're going to have a more concentrated solution and as we add more water it dilutes now here you can see a picture of a couple of volumetrics and you also have a glass pipette here this is known as a volumetric pipette it's a way of delivering a very specific volume of the liquid if we're going to end up making a less concentrated solution so let's say on the, the the shelf back there i already have a solution of six molar sodium chloride in water so i've got a six molar solution of sodium chloride but for the lab i really need a different concentration than that i only need 2.4 molar well you can use dilutions of a known concentration known volume to get to the concentration that you want so how you would do a dilution situation to make a um, so one way was using solid this way you're using a solution uh, to make a certain concentration so you can also make a solution by diluting a, diluting a more concentrated solution from a stock solution so you use a pipette to deliver the volume of the solution to your volumetric flask so you can get a very precise measurement of the volume and then you add your solvent to the line once again so you basically put in your concentrated solution dilute it and swirl and then dilute until you get to once again the line on the volumetric flask so you can also get a specific volume one liter 500 milliliters depending on the volumetric through dilution as well as through putting in and adding a mass now since the number of moles of the solute remains the same in the concentrated and the dilute situation we can use the dilution equation you may remember from last year so really we've got the same number of moles before and after we add the water so the number of moles are equal to each other well remember molarity is moles over liters and if we have volume in liters liters can cancel we have the moles well if the moles not changing then the molarity times the volume before has to equal the molarity times the volume after so ones represent the initial volume typically your concentrated situation here and two would represent your final or your dilute molarity situation Another thing they introduced in section 4.6 is solution stoichiometry. Remember, stoichiometry is going from one substance to another. So we've got to have a balanced equation here. But we're assuming we've got the balanced equation. Now, normally what you do is you take something like a given mass and you would convert it into moles. And then you can use the mole ratio to go from the moles of one substance to moles of another. And then you would convert that into a mass using molar mass again. So it'd be a three-step mass to mass stoichiometry problem. Well, molarity is also a bridge to moles. Remember, the key to this whole thing is in order to do stoichiometry, you have to get to moles. And one of the things I talked about last chapter, or two chapters, well, I guess it was last chapter, a little bit when we were getting ready for the chapter one through three test, was the idea that in stoichiometry, we can do it in a variety of situations because all we have to do is get to moles. Well, I can use density, in essence, to get to moles because I can use volume to mass, mass to moles, and then I can get get to moles well you can also do the same thing with concentrations and volumes so for this particular cap chapter the solutions chapter what you're really looking at is you can go and do stoichiometry from a mass point of view or if you know the volume and the concentration from 
a volume point of view. So what you're looking at on the wings here would be what you measure in the lab. In a lab, you're measuring mass or you're measuring volume. Those are our two most common measurements we make in a lab. If we're going to do stoichiometry, we'd have to convert those into a non-lab unit, a chemical unit like moles. Because remember, it's all about the moles. In order to use stoichiometry, we have to go from the moles of one substance to moles of another. So we can use molar mass to get there, or we can use molarity to get there. So what we really have is another situation to plug into our whole stoichiometry idea. If we're given a volume and a molarity, we can also get to moles. We can also do stoichiometry. And remember, once we get to moles, we use the mole ratio from the balanced equation to get to moles of another substance. But the key really is we have to get to here. We have to get to moles. And we can do that a variety of different ways. So what we're looking at here is just one other tool for stoichiometry. Now, one of the things we're going to do in our lab next week, we're actually going to do an oxidation reduction titration. You guys did an acid-base titration last year, so we could do that again. I would like to do really a, a different application of ideas. So we're going to look at oxidation reduction titrations this time. Now, remember a titration from last year is an analytical technique in which you can calculate the concentration of a solute in a solu solution using stoichiometry. So it's an experimental technique where we're going to take some measurements and use stoichiometry to figure out what the concentration of our unknown substance is. So we determine the concentration of one substance by allowing it to undergo a specific chemical reaction of known stoichiometry with another substance whose concentration is known. So we have an unknown substance and a known substance, and we have to know the chemical equation that we're looking at. You have to have the balanced equation to use stoichiometry. So the known substance is referred to as the standard solution. So in your lab, you're going to have a standard solution, a substance of known concentration, and you're going to use that to figure out the concentration of an unknown substance. And instead of an acid-base neutralization, we're going to do an oxidation reduction reaction to get to our endpoint. But it's really the same idea. The point at which the stoichiometrically equivalent quantities of the two chemicals are brought together is known as the equivalence point of the titration. So in a titration, we basically are putting our two substances together and reacting them until we get to what's called the equivalence point, the point at which we have equivalent stoichiometric amounts of our things. Now, in a titration, we often use an acid-base indicator to allow us to determine when the equivalence point is reached. We call that the end point of the titration. If you use the right indicator, your end point occurs at the equivalence point, and those two things are the same. But really, they don't have to be. So if you have an inappropriate acid-base indicator, your endpoint isn't the same as your equivalence point, and therefore your titration don't, doesn't work. So an indicator is chosen so that the endpoint corresponds to the equivalence point, and we know when to stop our titration and obtain our measured values. So if we stop the titration at the endpoint, we know the volume of the standard solution needed to reach the equivalence point, and we then have enough information to calculate the unknown concentration. And that's really where the stoichiometry comes in. So what we're really doing is when we reach the end point, we stop and we find out, OK, what volume of our known solution did we have to add to get to our end point or equivalence point? Now, you're going to convert the volume of the standard solution used in liters to moles using molarity. So in order to do our stoichiometry part, we got to get to moles. Well, if we have our volume of our known substance, and as a known substance, we know its concentration, we can convert the volume to a molar amount. And then second, you convert the moles of the standard solution to moles of the unknown solution using the mole ratio from the balanced equation. That's why this is a stoichiometric technique. Now, I'm not sure last year when you got into this how well you understood the stoichiometry, uh, but that's really what the relationship is. So we're not going to use any short shortcuts with this. So we're going to use the stoichiometric relationship because that's really what you need to understand. And then you could apply it in a bunch of different situations. So once we know the moles of our known, we can determine the moles of our unknown using stoichiometry. And since we know the volume of our unknown, you can take the moles and divide it by the volume in liters, and you can calculate the molarity of the unknown. So that's really what a titration calculation is. So it really involves three things. And the experimental part is step one. Then we do two mathematical relationships. Now, here's a typical titration problem. Calculate the concentration of HCl if it takes 35.45 milliliters of NaOH of point, or 2.25 molar NaOH to neutralize 20.00 milliliters of HCl. So HCl is our unknown because we know the concentration of the sodium hydroxide. 
Now in the titration, we knew it took 35.45 milliliters of the NOH to reach our endpoint or equivalence point. And we also knew the volume of the HCl that we had in our flask was 20.0 milliliters. And we'll take a look at how we put together that step one, two, and three to do this calculation. Now first you start with a balanced equation. In this case, since we have an acid and a base, this is our straight acid base neutralization. We have a metal hydroxide, so this is going to be a water forming double replacement reaction. So this would be our molecular equation for this neutralization reaction. Now, what you're doing in the titration is going through a series of steps to convert from the volume of NaOH eventually to the concentration of the HCl. And you can do this in individual steps, but I think it's much easier and in terms of avoiding rounding errors to just do it as a straight dimensional analysis problem. Now you start with your volume of your known which is 35.45 milliliters. And since molarity deals with liters, you'll notice down here, I converted that to a liter amount. I didn't show the math because that's something you can do in your head. But if I have a volume in liters, I can use molarity of our known substance to convert that to moles. And then next comes the stoichiometry part. It's a one-to-one -one mole ratio based upon that balanced equation. And now I would have mathematically, if I go through and do the calculation, the moles of HCl. Well, molarity is moles per liter. So if I take the moles of the HCl, which is the unit I have at this point right here, and divide it by the volume of the HCl in liters, I would have the molarity. So this is pretty easy to do as a three-step dimensional analysis problem. So that's an example of a typical titration problem. In this case, it was a nice simple one-to-one -one stoichiometry, but it doesn't have to be. And when we're doing redox reactions, we're not looking at an acid-base neutralization. We're looking at the actual oxidation reduction balanced equation. And that's what we're going to look at when we talk about the lab, because this is really what we're going to be doing in the lab next week. But that's a discussion for another day. And that ends our final set of notes over the chapter.